the opportunity to uh, share with you about my work and what I'm doing. Um, for those of you who were able to attend the opening yesterday, um, some of my presentation will be very familiar and perhaps redundant. I apologize for that. Um, but I'm going to share with you some information about the body of work that I have up in the gallery right now. And then I'd like to share with you um, what I've been doing since then. So that body of work um, was my very first collection that came out. Um, and so then I'll take you through what I've been doing since then and what I'm doing now. Um, and then after that, I would love you know, to open it up to comments and questions. Um, I'm honestly an open book, so you can ask me anything. Um, and I just want to you know, thank you so much for inviting me um, and for giving me this opportunity to, to share all of my work with you and engage with your community. <clears throat> so I'm a textile artist um, or fiber artist. Those terms I feel are pretty interchangeable in most places, though it seems like um, textile art is a term that you see a lot more internationally and fiber art is a term that the US seems to prioritize but they they mean the same thing <clears throat> so I'm a textile artist from rural northern Minnesota where my husband and I are raising our nine children my husband Anton Troyer is a professor at Bemidji State an author culture bearer spiritual leader and activist for the Ojibwe community. Initially, I chose to play a supporting role to his life's work by being a stay-at-home mom to facilitate all of the needs of our very large family. I'm a storyteller who made an unusual entrance into this craft. My children's participation in a traditional Native American ceremony required me to make blankets as part of their offering. Because they were made as a spiritual offering, the process was very spiritual for me. And because it was the only way I could contribute as a non-Native woman, I poured everything I had into those offerings. Being a creative person, I didn't make block quilts like everyone else. My blankets pictorially depicted the Native American names gifted to my children when they were born. After a decade of creating blankets for private spiritual ceremonies, I transitioned to creating portraits in 2018. My first gallery exhibition was in January 2020. In the process of creating my first collection, I realized how much my husband's life's work has impacted the way I see the world and the way I see myself. Being exposed to his world was like turning on a light bulb or my third eye being opened. All of my textile portraits depict what I now see. As the only white person in my Native American family, my work is about my reflections as an outsider and the emotional roller coaster I often ride as I stand fixed on the outside of the cultural experiences of my husband and my children, but privileged enough to look in. It's not simply about the pieces of Ojibwe culture I've been allowed to see, but it's instead what it's allowed me to see within myself and even to recognize what cannot be found there. My first collection was a series of 11 portraits depicting each of my nine children, my husband and myself. Through the images and the artist statements for each portrait, I opened the door into our personal lives. I was vulnerable and I was honest. I'd like to tell you a little more about what you see and what my work means to me. First of all, I am well aware of issues concerning cultural appropriation. My dearest friend, a native woman, expressed concern early on in this project about what people would have to say about me creating images that represent and are absolutely about Ojibwe culture. To that, I'd like to say that I recognize that that may make some people uncomfortable. 
And I'd love to have a conversation about that, should it be anyone's concern. I've not created this work to be provocative, and I will not shy away from that conversation. What I would like people to understand is this. What you see before you is what my life looks like. These are the people with whom I'm most intimately connected. And in this collection about identity, it was incredibly important to me to accurately depict my family members as authentic to who they are as I could. So there are three portraits in my initial collection that I feel portray Ojibwe culture so clearly that it would not be lost on anyone. I would also argue that these three human beings in particular, my son Evan, my son Isaac, and my husband, all hold their heritage in very high regard. These three Ojibwe men in my life, they absolutely want you to know that they are Ojibwe. It's central to how they see themselves. And so to be true to who they are, these images are exactly how they need to be, made by the non-native woman who loves them. The goldfinch is a constant in my work. It is the language bird in Ojibwe culture. In my work, however, I've expanded their representation to include the entire Ojibwe cultural and spiritual toolbox, if you will, which also includes the language. What I've experienced with traditional Ojibwe culture and spirituality is that it is so much deeper than a simple representation of past customs. The traditional food, clothing, language, and music, etc. It all has layers upon layers of meaning. Those things explain to them how to connect to the earth, to the spirits that dwell here, to each other, and to oneself. The birds represent that depth of knowledge and understanding that my family and other Ojibwe people who follow a traditional path possess about who they are, where they come from, and what their purpose is while they're here. This is my self-portrait. It is about the cocktail of both despair and hope that I feel as a mother and wife in this family and about my purpose in this world. I'm in the dark and naked. I often feel I have nothing to offer my children or my husband. I am of Scandinavian descent, but I don't even know what that means to me. I don't have ways of being handed down and taught with, taught with purpose. I don't have things that are known by my people and through my people from ancient times. I don't have spiritual gifts, birthrights to bestow, etc. No toolbox. I'm just out here winging it, loaded up on American culture, gas stations, shopping malls, McDonald's. I didn't realize how little I had until I realized my husband had so much. I didn't know how lost I felt until I became aware of how sure-footed my husband and my children are. But I have hope. The antlers are on top of my head as if to say, there is something incredible about me too. I also possess a spectacular gift. I can't see it, but I can feel it, as though it's within my very bones, passed down from my ancient tribe too. And someday I'll know how to use it and be empowered by it. My second project was a mini collection of three portraits which were released in 2020 titled The Female Body. The first is of my mother, the second is a self-portrait, and the third is of my youngest daughter. Mother discusses societal messaging about aging as a woman in today's society. It proposes that we as a culture don't celebrate the onset of our gray hair. We don't see menopause as a rite of passage. We don't celebrate our laugh lines as physical reflections of how many times we've laughed in our lives. And uh, we don't see the transitions of a woman's body as sacred. We haven't rewritten the narrative to assert that aging is beautiful, but what if we did? This is what InQ Arts wrote about my piece. A self-portrait of repurposed pieces of fabric, Blair Troyer's I've Made Peace With My Body, 
is an affirmation of the female form as a source of power. Um, sorry, I lost my slide. Okay, using sewing as a medium, typically seen as women's work, the artist has reconstructed their self-image. Even though nude, this image is not a fetishization or erotic portrayal. Instead, we are greeted with a sitting figure, legs spread, leaning forward and staring at us, a challenging pose typically reserved for the male form. Her body emerges from the darkness, a mass of swirling lines and subdued colors, symbolic of detrimental effects of the portrayal of women in media and society. This emergence symbolizes her acceptance of herself and the rejection of body norms and expectations. She occupies the space completely, assuming a sense of power, and is accompanied by a bird, a symbol of nature, the natural, and the delicate. It is in this moment that we realize this self-acceptance is a delicate thing, long fought for and needing to be nurtured. Um, this last piece is a portrait of my daughter, and I created a sh real short video um, that expresses um, not only what this piece means to me, but the experience I had creating it. Nine years old, indigenous female, delighting in the wonder and beauty of this body. But with each passing year, the risk of violence and sexual abuse increases. Not because of a troubled childhood or drug use or trusting the wrong person. Not because of lack of supervision or being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Not because of what she wears or how she conducts herself. My daughter is at risk because someone else's child will devalue her. And dehumanize her. My daughter is at risk of human trafficking because someone's son is a paying customer. When I think of her body, I see the darkness that surrounds her. I'm asking you to be the light and give me hope. The following portraits are from my current body of work. It's a massive series of 26 portraits that I've been working on since January 2020. This collection of portraits is titled Becoming, the transition from childhood to womanhood. And it, it will make its debut at the Textile Center in Minneapolis in January. This exhibition celebrates my 12-year-old daughter's journey and ceremonial rite of passage into womanhood. Important revelations in this series involve, but are not limited to, the following themes. Our relationship to the natural world and the relevance of imagination. Cultural views, attitudes, and communication regarding the physical transitions of the female body definitions of womanhood and the teachings we share with our daughters about what it means to have a female body and how to protect it in today's society. 
Fiber arts have historically been diminished as craft or women's domestic work, but I insist that it is a sophisticated fine art medium. I want to inspire exploratory work in the field of textile portraiture and be one of the catalysts pushing this medium forward into gallery spaces and in arts education. Because I'm self-taught, my approach to textile portraiture is unique. The images are often confused with paintings until experienced in person. My approach is captivating and people generally stand as close as possible to examine it because their familiarity with fabric has them wondering how I did that. I'm not afraid to explore new approaches to fabric, nor am I afraid to engage in challenging topics with my work. My portraits explore intimate parts of my life and center on the juxtaposition between my white culture and my husband's traditional indigenous culture, and have ranged in topics from drug abuse, social ostracization, body image, femininity, and masculinity, sexual abuse and exploitation, and aging, with spirituality deeply woven into their narratives. My work is vulnerable, honest, and personal, but often makes universal connections. Even when my work is dark, it's filled with hope. Thank you so much for allowing me this opportunity to share my work with you. Um, and I would love to hear your questions and comments if you, if you would like to engage with me. <laughs> yes. How is the Ojibwe socio-cultural perspective of women and their contributions to the world differ uh, from those uh, put upon by Western society? Yeah. Um, so, our family's interpretation of that is that um, there are, there's absolute equality, but that doesn't necessarily mean that um, you have the same types of power. You know what I mean? So like, I feel like um, modern contemporary culture really tends to diminish the types of power that we associate with, um, with women, with femininity, like our, the care culture or like care industry is one of the um, least financially compensated industries. Like we don't see that as, um, equally powerful, equally important. Um, so they don't have like clear definitive gender roles per se. Um, and femininity and masculinity are accepted much more on a spectrum, right? Mm -hmm. But they regard the attributes of both genders as equally important to the health and well-being of the society. If that answers your question. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. Have you thought about continuing? I know you talked about uh, how your next collection deals with uh, the issues surrounding violence against uh, indigenous, indigenous women. Have you? Um, come into contact with some of, uh, some of the more outspoken uh, activists uh, in the community, like, um, oh God, I can't remember her name, but I've seen her on a dozen uh, documentaries uh, uh, focusing on uh, violence against uh, indigenous women. Yeah. Um, especially in, 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 in light of uh, the more recent events, such as the murder of Savannah Greywind. I don't know, um, I'm not familiar with um, what, how North Dakota has experienced the 
um, silent epidemic of missing and murdered indigenous women. I don't know the stats for your state. I think it's high because of um, the pipeline coming in several years ago. The, um, so I can only speak to my state. Um, though, you know, I, I have friends in other communities outside of Minnesota that, you know, are sharing their experiences with me as well. But um, I know that the Duluth area has ended up being a real hot spot yeah. for, for trafficking. That's and I have um, lots of very good friends in the indige indigenous community who um, that is their life work. Um, um, transitioning trafficked women back into society. Um, so, yeah, I, it is very much on my radar, and I think that it's hard to, um, it's hard to raise daughters in the world today, you know, as a preteen, feeling totally comfortable letting them bike 10 miles away from your house. Wh whoever you are, I think we're, you know, um, I think that that's an issue that resonates with lots of people wouldn't feel comfortable letting their 10, 11, 12 year old daughter and son, um, you know, do something like that. And I th so I think I would feel that anyway, but the fact that my children are native makes it scarier for me um, because of, you know, that, yeah, what you referenced, the, the, it is an epidemic. Yeah. of missing and murdered indigenous women. Um, and I don't always, valid or not, I don't always trust that people will um, humanize my children. Exactly. So, yeah. Do you think, um, like, do you look at your art as like a medicine that could like heal, like, I don't know, like col colonization from our ancestors and all that? like? I do. I hate to be that bold and be like, <laughs> I'm, I'm on a mission That's to save the world. But um, that is where I've ended up. Like, I didn't set out to um, to like be an art activist or something. But um, that is what my art ends up being is um, begging us to try something different, or see it a different way, or support each other or, you know, it is kind of like a, yeah, not to, not like a call to arms, but like a, a call to like um, collective understanding and compassion for, you know, our neighbors <laughs> and each other. Yeah, and I, I do hope to um, inspire other people to, um, you know, I don't want to say like get involved in a you know organization or something though that would be great, but inspire people to um, look at how they're living their lives, um, how they're the conversations they're having with their kids, um, the ha conversations they're having with their friends, um, yeah, and just kind of the I I believe that we can all do better. For, for non-Native American, for, in fact, just for Western Caucasian artists who, who indulge in, in art that focuses on non-Western, non-Caucasian cultures, how does one reconcile with that dichotomy? Right. Yeah, um, it's not like my position with my work, you know, I alluded to this, I'm not like 100% comfortable with it. Um, I have tons of Native friends that are also artists who really espound the idea that artwork should, you know, you should rally behind Native artists, not behind Native-inspired art, right? 
and I don't want to be the voice of Native Americans. That's not my job. And I don't want to, I'm not trying to use my work to teach people about Native American culture. Instead, what I'm hoping that I'm doing is using the tiny bit that I want to share um, as something that is like a mirror for the rest of us to self-reflect about what we're doing, like how we're saying this, right? How we're engaging with the world. How does that look different? Um, it's almost as if you're documenting uh, your, uh, your family's own individual experiences. Yeah, but what I have learned too is that um, some of the things that I grew up with, we just do because that's what everybody did, or that's what the people who, you know, that's what my grandparents did, or like, I don't know, it wasn't really thought out. Um, and so I, I just want to show people that um, if we're not intentional about what we're doing, maybe we're doing it wrong, you know? Um, and I don't want to put anybody off by saying this, but so my next collection is about my daughter's transition to womanhood, right? Um, and we had, it's a huge, it's a huge event in a young woman's life in Native culture for us living traditionally. It's a year-long ceremony, um, and it is incredibly beautiful. And what she learns is that um, she is coming into her power right now. Um, and we get everybody together, and you know, it's not it's the, it's a ceremony led by women, but men are also there, and like everybody tells her how proud they are of her. Right? what they want for her future, like um, they listen to the community talking about how no one has the right to hit you, no one has the right to coerce you, no one has the right to deny your sanctity. Everybody sitting there listening to that. Her brothers are there, right? My husband's there, her uncles are there. We're all saying, you are a spiritual being, you're a sacred being, and you're on a powerful journey that you have agency over, and we're all here to support you. Do you want to know what I learned when I got my period? You don't have to tell anybody you're going to hear about this office. Right? Mm -hmm. Like... That is disgusting. That is painful. That is embarrassing. That is humiliating. That is not worth talking about. Don't talk about it. And pretend it's not even happening. And so I'm just saying, like, I don't, I'm not saying we should all pretend to be native and do what the natives do. I'm just saying, I think sometimes we could do things a little bit more intentionally mm -hmm. and thoughtfully and Sometimes we miss opportunities when we aren't intentional mm -hmm. and thoughtful about what we're saying to our youth. Yep. It's very much, you very much have, you know, that attitude with regards to women's bodies and how we, uh, we would be able to project ourselves uh, into the public in the very same vein as Judy Chicago has done with uh, the dinner party and the, uh, uh, the installation that she did back in the, in the 70s or 80s, uh, where she the, uh, um, provided these panoramic uh, episodes of what was then regarded as you know, the typical uh, life of, of American women. You know, the kitchen, the uh, bathrooms, and all that other stuff. But it was, it was an in-your-face experience that really challenged uh, the American public, but especially women, about yeah. how they are perceived yeah. in, in society and what should be done about it. I mean, how to embrace our our bodies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I um, 
So my my youngest daughter got this diary where it has a um, a voice activated code, right, to open it up. And so as her code, she picked the word tampon. <laughs> she was six. And I was like, why did you pick that? She goes, because even if people find out what my secret code is, they're not going to want to say it. <laughs> <laughs> but we, I'm trying really, really hard to cultivate a body positive environment. So at six years old, where did she learn that? How did she already come to the understanding that that part of the female experience is something to be ashamed of, embarrassed by? You know what I mean? Like, I didn't give her that information. But she already got that negative messaging about her body from somewhere. And so all I'm saying is, hey, can we not do that? <laughs> can we do better than that? I definitely think that Western culture can learn a lot from other culture cultures that. We're going to open. Yeah, sorry, so sorry. We're going to open it up to the rest of the group. So you got some questions. Let's. We've got some other hands. So yeah. sorry to cut you. But go ahead. Um, with your, I guess you could say you started off with quilting, and then when did you decide like, oh, portraits would be like really cool? Like, did you used to paint before? And how long does it like usually take for you to actually like finish a piece? So I dabbled in painting. Um, I was raised by very practical parents who told me that. You know, even though they, they said I was gifted, that that's not something that I should pursue. Um, so I, I did it for fun on my own when I was a kid. Um, but I never leaned into it. And then I had to make a bunch of blankets for ceremony for my kids. And then after my youngest child went through the ceremony, honestly, I didn't know if I would ever sew again. Because um, I couldn't tell if I fell in love with creating because of why I was doing it and that it was a gift for my children and, and that that would just happen to be a beautiful experience and I didn't know if it would translate. Um, but shortly after that, after her, she went through, I knew that I wanted to keep going and this time I wanted to see what I could do. And as far as you know, art goes, I'm always drawn to the figure and to portraits. Like that, that has always been my favorite. And so I knew that when I wanted to practice and see if this is something I could even do, I knew that portraits was where I wanted to start. Um, and doing fiber takes me a really, really long time. So. Um, the pieces that you'll see at the gallery, the least amount of time I spent on one of those was about 200 hours. Yeah, and they usually take me at least, like that size, the smallest ones over there, take me about three days just to sew them, like eight hour days, like just to sew them. It's pretty fast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Some of them took longer, like the, the more frustrated I am <laughs> with the piece. Yeah, the longer it takes, and the quicker it comes to me, the faster, you know, the faster and easier it is. Yeah. Do you sell your pieces? I do. Um, they're a bit difficult to sell um, in that, like I said, they take me 200 hours, so they're kind of pricey. Um, but in addition to that, the collection that you, you see over there came out in 2020, and it's traveling until 2024. And so, at, you know, it's, it's been difficult for me because people who are interested in purchasing them and then have to wait like four years before they can even get it, knowing that it's going to travel likely all over the world before it gets to them. And um, so that's been a little bit um, challenging for me. But yes, I have sold because some people dig that. Some people think that's really cool. Um, so, yeah, but, but it is. It is difficult for me when I, I, 
Because the goal for me, yes, I, I would love to sell them. I don't want them to end up in my basement. You know what I mean? But um, I just really want them to be seen. I want more conversations to be had. I, um, that's more important to me than, than selling. Yeah. Uh, what kind of fabric do you use? Everything. <laughs> Everything. Yeah, I'm a bit of an environmentalist at heart. So my initial, like, piece that I put down to then place everything on is usually a like old sheet, something that somebody is trying to discard. Um, and then I, I do buy new fabric because that's pretty fun. Um, but I, I try to like people donate to me. I even use my kids old clothes that they trashed and or like old, you know, Halloween costumes. And I can use everything from sequins to upholstery to like weird leathery stuff. Like I get to use everything, and that's really exciting to me. Yeah. So how do you like blend the fabric so well? Like when you're shaping the sleeves, do you dye it yourself? I don't. I don't. I so what helps me the most is having a really wide color palette. So when I look for fabric, I never buy a yard of it. I always buy like an eighth of a yard, so it ends up being a strip like this long because I need lots of variations of, of that certain color in order to do something like that. Um, I love working with batiks too, so they kind of look hand dyed, and that helps me, um, you know, find something that looks kind of like a, like a eyelash. You know what I mean? Like there's what like batik. Yeah, yeah, they look hand dyed almost. Yeah. So, what would you say that you work with? You like work with sewing machine, a sewing machine, a serger, and like an embroidery machine? I only work with a sewing machine. Um, I have a quilting machine that I don't know really how to use yet. <laughs> so, that's the next step of my next project is to figure out how to do that. Um, but yeah, I just use a regular sewing machine. Um, and when I'm finished with the project I'm working on right now, I do want to get into embroidery, but my, um, I don't think I'll ever use an embroidery machine because you can't, um, you can't like, um, free draw embroidery on machines. You have to program it. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to do art that way. Like I... I need to do as it, like, I don't plan it out, right? It's more intuitive, like, as I'm creating the piece, then I know what I want. So um, I, I'm going to try to figure out a way to um, fake embroider <laughs> by, by my own drawing stitching. Um, on my next pieces, at least that's the goal. I like that, uh, that that work aesthetic because at least when you do it by hand, you really get the sense of the fabric, the very uh, the, 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 the very essence of the individual fabric. Whereas if it's mechanized, you take away that 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 special something. Yeah, no, I do think like I consider myself a crafter, so I need the the doing part. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Would you ever think about using like a like a tufting like a tufting gun? Have you ever seen those? I uh, no. It's like it was a trend for a while to make rugs, and so you'd be oh, right through it. Yeah. Yes, I have seen that. I have seen that. Um, I don't. You know, I don't know what the future holds. I don't know what all I will branch out into. Um, so we'll see. I mean, I feel like I'm at my infancy with my work. Like, I feel like I'm just getting started. I don't even know what I'm capable of yet. Um, so I have no idea where it will take me and what all I will learn along the way. Yeah. So looking at like your, your work being, you know, coming from being self-taught, working with sewing, and you talked about how much of a struggle that was initially. Mm -hmm. um, how have you have do you have any fellow artists or people maybe in like textile or fabric arts communities that you've gotten connected with or or been inspired by other fabric uh, artists? So um, 
I am a bit of an outlier in that um, I was the, I'm the kind of, I'm self-taught 100% um, and like nobody even showed me how to use my sewing machine, I just had to figure it out. But I, um, I'm more of a, I'm inspired by these materials and I'm just gonna see what happens with this. So um, I do know other textile artists now and they speak a language I don't understand. <laughs> because I, I don't even know what my sewing machine is called, you guys. Like, I don't know what it, I don't even know what all the buttons do. I don't know, you know, like, I'm, I'm more of a like, hi, I made this. <laughs> um, so I, I feel out of place in that world. And I worry that they're gonna be judgy about my stuff because they're gonna see that I don't know what I'm doing or that I don't do it like them. Um, and then, you know, the, the other art world, I'm an outlier there too, because um, they don't always understand. Like a lot of galleries I've worked with didn't even know what to call my pieces. Like, is this, what is this te textile art, fiber art? Like, what should we call you? I don't even know, you know? So, yeah, <laughs> that answer your question. Okay, sir. <laughs> yeah. Could you um, just address the McKnight Fellowship a little bit and how sure. does that happen sure. to artists and how does that impact your trajectory? Yeah. Um, I am very new to the art world and I have been incredibly lucky um, with what has evolved since I hopped on the scene. Um, so I, this year, I am a McKnight Fellow. I, so that fellowship is one of the largest fellowships in the country for textile artists. Um, and they, it comes with like a huge cash prize that they just give you. And you don't even have to tell them what you're gonna do with it. Um, it's, a, it's a fellowship where they're just like, we've seen what you have created and we believe in you, go. <laughs> um, so that has been incredible for me. Um, and part of what came as the result of that uh, fellowship is um, the Textile Center in Minneapolis is hosting my show, my next body of work. And they've roped a bunch of other people into my career um, to help me um, to help me better manage my career. And that has been wild <laughs> and wonderful. Yeah. Are you teaching Mama Cash? Like, what are we talking? What are we talking? <laughs> <laughs> like $25,000 that I don't have to explain what I did with it. <laughs> yeah, so you bust out your sewing machine. New, new slash you're buying fabric. Right? <laughs> yeah, I bought my like, clothing machine that I don't know how to use. <laughs> yeah, but you know, the most rewarding part, um, like the financial part was great for me because I'm new and so getting this fellowship was incredibly validating for me, right? I, I put my stuff up out there and I was so worried like, about being an imposter, right? Because I made this up myself. I don't even know what it is. Quilters will talk to me about techniques and I'm like, is that what I did? I don't know, you know? And I um, was so unsure of myself. I didn't even know if I should call myself an artist until my stuff was on a wall in a gallery because then I felt like, oh, that legitimizes me. I can say that now. Like, you know, I, so I was coming from that. So the, the fellowship told me, yes, you're on the right path this is what you should be doing. Um, but with that, you know, they're roping other people into my career. So like um, the most humbling and incredible part of that fellowship for me right now is, and scary part of that fellowship for me right now is that um, my show at the textile center is going to be critiqued by the head curator for painting from the Minneapolis Institute of Art. Ooh. And from the curator of American Craft for the Smithsonian. <gasps> oh my gosh! So, so I'm super stressed right now because <laughs> it's not done. Um, 
But yeah, I, the fellowship has been just one of the most incredible things that has happened to me on this journey so far. Especially being rural, you guys. Like, a rural artist where the closest major art center is over four hours away from me. Mm -hmm. um, and I just, I, I struggled for mentors who could help me. Um, and you know, my, the biggest lesson I learned is that this, a journey as an artist is not a, a linear trajectory. It's not like you do A and then B happens and then C happens and then, you know, like it looks different for everyone. And so I was really clamoring for direction. I didn't know, and I'm sure I made tons of mistakes along the way as a beginner artist who didn't know, you know, the best path for me. Um, so yeah, this fellowship is kind of helping me. They're, they're, they've chewed me out a little bit of some of the decisions I made, so, you know, but they're helping me um, find where I belong. Yeah. What sort of techniques do you utilize to achieve the right type of texture uh, with each piece of fabric? I mean, do you burn? Do you freeze? Do you? I don't do anything fancy. I'm lazy. No. <laughs> I just cut it and I place it there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I need, I, it moves slowly. My work will move slowly. So I don't want to make it any slower. <laughs> but maybe in the future. Maybe in the future. I would, yeah. So, um, Last night in the gallery, I noticed on your piece with your non-biological son, um, there are parts that do look like a mortar. Was that part of the fabric you sampled, or was that something you act on to yourself? Was it the one where there, he's like got a scarf? It's like with the purple flowers kind of looking things. Yes. I drew that. Okay. I drew that with my machine. So that's what I mean about like, how I think, like I want to incorporate embroidery and the, the way in which I, well, I want to try to explore creating my own by drawing it, like physically drawing it on the fabric. Um, I don't know how successful I'll be at that, but um, I'm going to try. Yeah. Well, there, I think we have time for one more question maybe in the back. Okay, yeah. Um, as far as like your artwork that you're doing right now, I know you're doing it like as like pretty much kind of like a documentation as your family and then your children being Native Americans and things like that. As far as like your art going uh, onwards, it would always kind of be like the same kind of thing where it's kind of more like indigenous, more based. And then if say um, you would have done something else, um, like document something else, do you think your artwork obviously would have gotten the attention that it did? Those are great questions. Um, uh, and I will, I will address the second one first and then go back to the first one that you asked. So um, I don't, I think that the artwork that I made has gotten attention for lots of different reasons. Um, my approach to fabric is different than quilters, so it's unusual. People haven't really seen that before. I think that's one of the reasons that I got attention for it, um, and, and because of my skill level. But my husband is also a very prominent figure in the region. I think that's another reason why people have paid attention to what I'm doing. Um, and when I get into shows or people want to see my work, um, they don't normally bring up that it's because some of it is um, native content. That's not what I hear. So whether that is the case or not, I don't really know. And that is a really good question. I don't really know what kind of role that has played in what has happened with my career. Moving forward, um, I think that the lessons I've learned in my family will always come out in my work. But moving forward, like the collection I want to do next 
is actually a large scale series of male nudes. Um, men that are preferably 40 years and older. I want bodies that have been lived in, that are not gym rats. Like, you know, I want to have discussions about, um, you know, male body image and um, masculinity and male sexuality and um, stuff like that. And and um, so I don't see Native American culture in that project. Um, though my son has agreed to be one of my um, one of my subjects, and he's the like I just said, I'm doing older people in here, and my son, but he um, he has ADHD, and so he agreed to let me do a portrait of him, and then interview him about his relationship with his body as he was growing up, where all the attention he got his whole life was negative about his body, that he couldn't like hold his shit together, that it, you know he was always in people's space. He was, um, so there will be a native piece, but that's not the thread of that body of work. And then after that, I want to explore my own indigeneity. I want to spend some time you know, in Scandinavia, filling up my empty cup. So that piece, or that series, is going to be all about me. Um, but I imagine, like, the reason I know my cup is, cup is empty is because of the life I'm living right now with my husband and children. And so I don't know what that's going to look like or how that will play out in those pieces or not. But that's a really great question. And I don't want to be considered um, a, you know, a native artist or native adjacent artist or be in native space. My voice doesn't belong there, right? Like native artists. So I could need to drive the conversation. I can see where you, what you did is that you took the beauty of your life with your children. So yeah. like, I understand like where that's coming from. I just kind of was asked like if you thought maybe you would have got more attention just because there's not a lot of artists that are out there that are doing the type of things that you're doing. So yeah. that's just all. It's yeah. just a question. Yeah. <laughs> well, if you have further questions for Blair, she's going to be here for a little bit longer yeah. today. Yeah. Um, we're going to catch some lunch and then head back to the gallery. Um, but I'd like everybody to give her a hand for <laughs> and I also want to thank everybody for their wonderful questions as well. Today, so. <laughs> Thanks, Blair.